What is up you guys and welcome back to my channel. My name is Danielle Hallen and I am back with another true crime case. So today we're going to be speaking about the death of 22 year old Brandon Michener. His mother reached out through my case suggestion form, which for those of you who don't know, it is listed down below. There is a link if you are family, however, always feel free to just reach out to me directly in my email. The second I began to look into her son's story, I immediately knew that I had to speak about it. There are a plethora of lessons that can be learned from this particular case. And there are common themes that we see all throughout these different cases that I cover here on my channel. And my demographics are mainly those in their late teens into their 20s. So I feel like this is going to hit right into the sweet spot of those that need to hear it. And apart from that, I genuinely feel like the entire town of Lansing, Michigan, and just everywhere in general, could be made a much safer place by hearing Brandon Michener's story and also hearing his mother's pleas for change. Before I get into the details of this case, I do need to say a huge thank you to Harry's for partnering with me on today's video. Partners like Harry's allow me to create this content to begin with and support these families however they may need. If you know me, you know I'm all about convenience, I'm all about sustainability, and I'm all about giving back to the community. And that is exactly why Harry's is not just my choice, but also my husband's choice of razor. Their new two-tone handle is not just razor usable, but 50% of the plastic in the handle is recycled. So instead of tossing away whole disposable razors every single month and swapping it out for a new one, all you have to do is take off the razor head, pop in a new five blade razor refill, and you are back to getting a smooth shave with a lot less waste. The blade box is even recyclable and refills are delivered straight to your door. Harry's razors are fair price razors for everyone. There is no pink tax, thank goodness. Don't even get me started on how I feel about the pink tax. And there's absolutely no sacrifice of quality. The flex hinge ensures that you can comfortably get into all the spaces that you need to. And the precision trimmer that's on there is the only reason that my husband does not look like a caveman about 100% of the time. My personal favorite, and I have raved about this over and over for well over a year, possibly two years now, is their shave cream. I have very, very dry and very sensitive skin, but this shave cream is packed with awesome things like hyaluronic acid, there is aloe, all of the things that my skin loves so I never have any issues with it irritating my skin. Plus, who doesn't love the smell of eucalyptus? Hands down, my favorite part about using Harry's products is that with every single purchase, I know that they're giving back. Harry's gives a percentage of the global sales to nonprofit organizations. So even an act as small as purchasing your daily self-care products can make a difference. Harry's has an amazing starter set filled with all of the things you need, a razor handle and blade, two blade refills, a blade cover and shave cream. You can go redeem your starter set today for just $3 when you go to harrys.com forward slash Danielle. Thank you again to Harry's and now on to the details of this case. Brandon was born to Stephen and Shirley Michener on May 27th, 1992 in Lansing, Michigan, and his entrance into this world was nothing short of miraculous. At the time, Stephen and Shirley already had five children when they became pregnant, and they quickly found out that they weren't just having one more baby, but they were actually going to have triplets. Unfortunately, after a very complicated pregnancy, two of the three babies were lost, and Brandon was the only survivor. Shirley and Stephen saw Brandon as their angel, and as he grew, he continued to fit even more into that title. Brandon, who was lovingly referred to as Brandino, was the glue that held the family together. Even as a child, he was always so caring. They explained that he was just this old soul, this guy that was just wise beyond his years. He always maintained a positive attitude. He saw the best in everything and could make anyone laugh. His mother said, quote, Brandon had the most contagious, beautiful smile that would make you smile. He loved to dance and his friends loved to watch him. He was funny, nice, and kind. And you can see why all of these different things made Brandon incredibly popular all throughout his childhood and into early adulthood. Brandon was the friend that stood up for others. He was the life of the party someone that you could always look up to. His mission in life was to help others set a good example and live life to the fullest along the way. Brandon loved to work out. He absolutely loved basketball, but unfortunately he found out at the height of 5'6 that he was probably too short to ever play professionally. So he decided to set his sights on a goal that he had wanted for a very long time. And that was to be a business owner. Brandon went to Lansing Community College right after graduating high school and he graduated from Lansing Community College 
college in 2014 with an associate degree in marketing, and he had plans for furthering his education. He wanted to eventually push towards a bachelor's degree in marketing. And all while in this final stretch of college, he decided, you know what? why wait? Why not go ahead and dive headfirst in creating my own business right now? And so he came up with the idea of a fashion brand called MIM or M-I-Y-M, an acronym for make it your mission. And I think more fully, he said, make it your mission to do the right thing. He had one of his sisters draw up the design and they started to print it all over sports clothing, baseball shirts. Um, I think they had just a few regular t-shirts, things like that. And he ended up going into business with a guy that he knew from high school. Now, this business partner has been redacted from all of the available police reports that I was able to get my hands on, so I will just be referring to him as John throughout the remainder of this video, and as a gentle reminder, please maintain that same respect in the comments below. From what Brandon's family and friends have stated in interviews, Brandon and John had never been close friends in high school. They were just really acquaintances, and even up to the point where they were working together, it still seemed like they were more so strictly business partners. I'm assuming that John just brought something to the table that would have been beneficial to the business and this is how they ended up in business together. Brandon was setting himself up for this beautiful life. He was a phenomenal example of a young black entrepreneur, but unfortunately his life ended up being cut short. On June 28th, 2014, Brandon spent the day with his family. The 29th of June was a well-known important day in the Michener household. Not only was it their father Stephen's birthday, but it was also Stephen and Shirley's anniversary. So it was 29th anniversary on the 29th. So this one in particular was huge. And to celebrate, Shirley and Stephen decided that on that early morning of the 29th, they were going to fly out, go to Florida, sit at a nice hotel, and enjoy some time together. So because of this, they decided to hold all their festivities and all the celebrations would be done the day before on Friday the 28th. During the family get together, Brandon mentioned to his parents that he was going to go out that night. He apparently had a high school friend that was turning 21, and so they were going to get on a party bus and be carted all around downtown Lansing. He had originally not been sure about going to this party. He had a very, very tight knit group of close friends, people that had been his friends for over a decade since he was very young. And this particular group of people, he did know the birthday boy, um, but he really didn't know anyone else that was going to be there. His business partner was one of the individuals that was going. So after a bit of persuasion, Brandon finally said, you know what, this could be fun. I guess I'll go. Mom made sure to tell Brandon, you know, please be careful, make good choices. And she remembers that Brandon responded by cupping his hands on her face and saying, you raised me well, I've got this. And this was the last time that Shirley would ever see her son. By later that night, I believe it was shortly after 11, Shirley woke up and was a little bit concerned that Brandon had not reached out to her. Despite the fact that Brandon was an adult, he can go off and party, do what he wants. He still usually maintained some sort of contact. He would always check in, a text message, a call or something to say, hey, I'm fine. This is where I'm at. Everything's great. But he hadn't done that yet. However, Shirley did not want to immediately panic or anything like that. Brandon, again, was an adult. He was capable of making good decisions. And she also remembered him stating something about staying the night at a friend's house afterwards. So she went back to sleep and that was that. The following morning, Shirley and Steven still hadn't heard from Brandon yet, but they were leaving very early in the morning. So again, not immediate panic. So they hopped on their plane and flew out to Florida. But the moment that they went to open their hotel door, they got a phone call that stopped them in their tracks. It was their daughter, Bianca. And she said that Brandon was missing. All Bianca knew was that she started receiving these messages on Facebook and seeing Facebook posts about people looking for Brandon and Brandon being missing. And when she started to try to reach out to him, she could not get in touch with him. His phone was going straight to voicemail, wasn't at home. They had been calling local hospitals, local jails, all to no avail. Nobody knew where Brandon was. And this was entirely unlike him. From the brief kind of overview I did looking through his Facebook and things like that. He was constantly on social media. He had seen he was in constant contact with friends. He seemed to be in constant contact with family. So for him to just kind of up and vanish overnight, 
something was definitely wrong. Stephen and Shirley booked the soonest flight they could, which didn't have them leaving until the following day of the 30th. And what happened that night that Brandon went out started to slowly come into focus. So as a quick rundown of the party itself and the plans that were there for that night, according to those that were there, this wasn't ever specifically hashed out in the police reports, but allegedly the birthday boy's father was part owner of a place called Suits Tavern in downtown Lansing. And it's right off of Washington. Washington Avenue. And he was the one who decided to set up and pay for this party bus. This party bus was supposed to pick them up at Suits Tavern to take them around downtown Lansing and then drop them back off at Suits Tavern. Not only did he hire this party bus, but he also started open tabs at all of the bars in downtown Lansing so that there was absolutely no limit to the partying that night. It seems that most of the guys that went drove themselves. Brandon drove himself there and also drove his business partner, John, and they all parked their cars nearby and then hopped onto the party bus. It doesn't seem that there was ever a plan for how everyone was supposed to get home after, you know, open bar hopping all night to this apartment to all stay the night. Um, it just, you can see how already this is just an absolute recipe for disaster. At 11.58 a.m. on Saturday, the 29th of June, so the following morning after the party, a phone call came into Lansing Police Department to report Brandon as missing. Officer Merlick was sent to South Washington and West South Street to speak to the caller, John. And this is about a mile away from Suits Tavern. According to the police report, John proceeded to tell Officer Merlick that he could not locate his friend Brandon. He had attempted to locate him, uh, called to all the jails, called to all the hospitals, was repeatedly calling Brandon's phone, but he just was not able to reach him. And he was worried because he had been with Brandon the night before at this party and Brandon had mentioned that his phone was dying. Now, he then went on to tell the officer, and this is directly from the police report, that that night they had both gone onto this party bus at Suits Tavern at around 7 p.m. They then went to multiple bars that night and ultimately ended back at Suits Tavern. John remembered at this point that Brandon was heavily, heavily intoxicated, and he stated that he was also very intoxicated, which is no surprise because they did not have to pay a tab the entire time they were out that night. Um, 21, 22-year-olds thrown in that situation, good grief. Uh, but Brandon was to the point where he could barely stand, according to John. And as everyone was back at the bar, back at Suits Tavern, from my understanding, everyone was trying to figure out what they wanted to do next, if they wanted to go home, if they wanted to um, go out to a few more bars. Brandon proceeded to walk off outside, so John saw this and decided to follow him. He stated that it was a common occurrence for Brandon to pass out at parties from drinking too much. This is what John has claimed. And so I'm assuming that he made the statement to show why he had some sort of concern for Brandon walking off on his own. And so basically he's saying that he just followed behind Brandon as Brandon headed off into the night. At some point during this walk, Brandon took off running and suddenly they were on this dead end street of West South Street. I will have a picture up on the screen so you can see exactly where they started and where they ended up. He told Officer Merlick that he was standing at the edge of the sidewalk when he heard a loud thud. And he pointed out to Officer Merlick as they're standing there the next day, this flat area just beside the sidewalk, uh, and stated that this is where he believed he heard that thud and that he believes that thud was Brandon falling. While he mentioned hearing this, he never specifically stated that he saw it. He claimed to believe that Brandon was vomiting. Uh, he had already been throwing up pretty much at the past couple of bars they had been at. So he ran back to the intersection of South Street and Washington Avenue to call a friend for help. For some reason, the friends could not locate him. And so instead of going back to help Brandon himself, John claimed he began running away and ended up at an Admiral gas station on South Cedar Street, which is about a half mile away and a 12 minute walk on foot, according to Google Maps. From there, John called a taxi, somehow made it back to the house that they all were supposed to stay at that night. And he says that he has absolutely no recollection of how he got into bed. The following morning, he just remembers waking up and remembering that Brandon had, quote, fallen over 
over. So he drove back to the location he last saw Brandon to look for him. And when he couldn't find him, that is when he ultimately called police. Now he explained to Officer Merlick that everything that night was very blurry and he couldn't remember a lot of it because of how drunk he was. Right away, police created a be on the lookout for Brandon. They took his description. They told John to continue contacting Brandon's family and friends, um, keep attempting to locate him. Officer Merlick also asked John to gather all of Brandon's uh, family information, like phone numbers, things like that, so that the police could reach out to them and speak to them. And at this point, this is when things started to come out on Facebook and Bianca, his sister, ultimately found out that Brandon could not be located. From my understanding, she and her husband, or at least one of Brandon's brother-in-laws, checked as many places as possible. He wasn't at home at all. He wasn't answering his phone. It was still going to voicemail. So ultimately, this is when Bianca decided to make the call to her parents to tell them that they couldn't find Brandon anywhere. After a few hours of searching and reaching out to people, by around 6 p.m. that night, Bianca showed up to where Brandon's car was still parked, and he had parked it in the 200 block of South Washington Avenue. I want to state real quick that the location of Brandon's car on the 200 block of South Washington Avenue is just north of Suits Tavern, like quite literally a block north of Suits Tavern, and is in the opposite direction of where Brandon ultimately ended up heading that night with John following him. Brandon had apparently indicated to his friends that night that he was feeling very ill. I don't think he really needed to indicate that because they already knew. He had thrown up already at a handful of bars. When they got back to Suits Tavern, there were witnesses there at the party that saw him go into the bathroom and continue vomiting in there. And he ultimately said that he needed to go home. He realized he was not in a good position. He had drank way too much and he wanted to get out of there. Except the problem was Brandon had been his own ride that night. And from my understanding, Standing again, he was also John's ride. So he didn't have any way of going home without calling for help. Now, I am entirely unaware of how close his house was to this location. I don't know if in his mind he believed it was a reasonable walk. Regardless of the direction that he went, regardless of where he thought he was going, John told police that he followed Brandon to make sure that he didn't drive with how intoxicated he was and to basically make sure he stayed safe. But if that was the case, I don't understand how he didn't stop Brandon after they walked over a mile. It says on Google Maps, the average walking time would be about 20 minutes. They were intoxicated, so there's no telling how long it actually took, but that is a very long way to walk. I will again show you the walk. They would have had to go over a highway, um, over a body of water, bridges, you name it, through multiple different, you know, streets. So you would think it was clear after about a 20 plus minute walk that Brandon had no intention of getting into his car and driving himself home. So I genuinely wonder if John had a plan here to get them both back to the house safely. Um, clearly he was the more sober of the two. Instead, he just kind of followed Brandon for almost half of an hour. There's just a lot of unanswered questions here. Now, once Brandon's sister arrived at his car, she called police for herself to inquire about Brandon's disappearance, which I don't know if that means that the family's information was never handed over to police and they hadn't reached out to her yet, or I've got no idea, but she wanted to speak to a police officer directly. Officer Merlick, who had responded to the original call from John, also responded to Bianca's call at 6.51 p.m. that night at Brandon's car. And according to the police reports, within a few minutes of speaking to Bianca, John showed up as well. It is not clear at all if Bianca called John asking him to come back to the car or if the police officer called John asking him to meet them there or if John just somehow knew they were there and showed up. But either way, all three of them ended up going back to West South Street to the last place that Brandon was known to be. While there, however, all of a sudden John changed his story, and this is indicated by Officer Merlick in the police reports. John had originally pointed out to authorities just hours earlier that flat spot by the sidewalk, and I don't know directly where he said. I will again have an image here so you can kind of get an idea of the different places it could have been. Um, and that is where he heard this thud where he said that Brandon, quote, fell over. But now he was all the way up by the tree line um, at the very end of the dead end, pointing down the riverbank, indicating that this is where Brandon could have fallen, basically right into the Grand River. This dead-end street essentially led into a 30-foot 
embankment, which I will have pictures up here of exactly what it looked like. I tried so hard getting all different angles on Google Maps and I just couldn't find it. And thankfully, I managed to find that some photos of this scene had been posted to Facebook. But this is the drop that was on the other side here. And, and according to a lot of different individuals that live locally, areas like this are all over downtown Lansing. And it doesn't seem like there's much on West South Street or pretty much any of these areas to prevent someone from falling over. Now, there is a guard rail here as you can see at the very end of West South Street but that's not really going to prevent anyone especially someone drunk from accidentally tumbling into the woods and over the cliff. But this also paints an entirely different picture of what could have happened to Brandon because initially it had been said by the last person to see him that he had just fallen over in the middle of the grass and this friend then left. So there was a huge possibility at that point that Brandon passed out there for a couple of hours and then got up and was wandering somewhere trying to find help. He didn't have a car, his phone could have been dead. Um, so there was a chance he was just out there somewhere in downtown Lansing. But now here we are hours later and John has completely changed his story to saying that Brandon fell over this cliff and down into the Grand River drunk, which indicates a potential drowning. John proceeded to pull out his phone and pulled up his call log and showed where at 1256 he said he started calling friends for help and he said that he started these calls almost immediately after Brandon fell. While peering over this edge where the road suddenly becomes a 30 foot drop down a steep embankment into the river below, Bianca spots something. She notices her brother's hat. So immediately seeing this it becomes even more clear that the chances that Brandon fell into this river are very high. So a search of this area begins. Sergeant Osborne responded to the scene and was immediately given a rundown of everything that was going on. Officer Merlick had attempted Brandon's phone a couple times as well. It was still going straight to voicemail. So they decided that attempting to get a ping on it probably was not going to be fruitful at all. They were going to get nothing from it. Officers had managed to find out that Brandon worked for a Menards in Delta. So they decided to call there to see if maybe this was one giant misunderstanding standing. Maybe Brandon somehow did get up and go to work and everything was fine, but they found out that he did not have a shift until the following day at 5 p.m. Sergeant Osborne at this point walked down at the steep embankment. He probably had to like rappel himself down it in some way, shape, or form, um, but about five to six feet into this wooded area of the embankment, they found Brandon's black and blue hat on the ground. A little bit further down, they found Brandon's tennis shoe, and then right at the edge of the river, was evidence of disturbance. There was about a two foot area where it appeared that debris had kind of piled up. There were broken branches, there were scuff marks. It appeared as if someone had kind of skid down the embankment. So the area was marked as clearly as possible and a dive team was called at around 7.30 in an attempt to search the Grand River. Unfortunately, at this point, it was 7.30 p.m. and even being in the summer, they probably only had a good hour left of sunlight. So despite calling the dive team, they said that the chances of this being a rescue mission, if Brandon had gone into the water the night before, it just wasn't likely. There was also still no solid confirmation that Brandon had gone into the water. Uh, and because this was more than likely just going to be a recovery mission, if he had to protect their divers, they decided to wait till the following day to search in the river. They did decide though to do a surface search and I do believe this was done by the Lansing Fire Department. They came and checked all along the banks of the river north and south of where the shoe and the hat was found but they couldn't find any sign at all of Brandon or any more of his belongings. Officer Merlick and Sergeant Eichenberg also conducted a search on foot in the embankment along the river but they also came up empty-handed. So at this point police began to speak to different individuals at the nearby apartment buildings and businesses and houses in the area to see if anyone saw or heard anything that night or possibly had surveillance footage. There was an apartment complex at the very end of the Stedden Road right to the right. Um, and a woman who lived in this apartment complex told police that she was a very light sleeper. So if there had been anything that happened that night, she likely would have woken up to it. She did not remember ever waking up to anything, but she did see something the morning of the 29th. According to her, she stated that she awoke that morning and was outside at around 10 a.m. She came in contact with two males. She noticed that they were running up and down the riverbank frantically. And it looked like they were trying to find something. And when she spoke to them, they stated that they were looking for a friend. John had told police that when he woke up the following morning that he drove to the location to try to look for Brandon, but 
from what I've seen in the police reports, he never mentioned being there with someone else. Uh, and he also didn't mention to police that he had already been there for two hours before calling police. And by the time police arrived, the second person was entirely gone. A lot of this information just seemed off and didn't make a lot of sense. John, according to his own interviews with police, stated that he followed Brandon in order to make sure that he was safe. Yet they both walked in a random direction for well over 20 minutes, over a mile away onto a dead end street. And he never stopped to say, hey, this isn't a good idea, let's call for help. And he heard Brandon fall, but never saw it and ran to the intersection to call friends for help, which does line up with his story if he followed Brandon to make sure he was safe. Yet despite all these claims of wanting to help Brandon and protect him this whole time, he ended up totally abandoning Brandon and ran another half mile in another random direction to a gas station, called a taxi, goes to a friend's house and falls asleep for the night. It had already been over 12 hours since he left Brandon either A, lying on the ground puking, according to his first story, or B, he left Brandon after hearing him potentially fall into a river drunk, according to his second story, and he didn't call for help. And then the following day, when he went out to look for him, it still took another two hours for the police to be called. They also spoke to a handful of other residents and most of them didn't remember hearing anything odd that night. There was one person that had some great information. One resident, while they didn't remember hearing anything, they did have a surveillance system. So the camera was on the apartment complex building and it was pointed towards the intersection of West South Street and Washington Avenue. So right at the intersection that John allegedly made phone calls to friends that they came off of to get onto West South Street. And if it was working, it would have captured both John and Brandon walking towards the dead end at the river. The resident showed police the video and I have a snippet here to show you. The timestamp of the footage, as you can see, is 1227 AM. It is painfully obvious how intoxicated Brandon is from the footage. They both start out walking side by side. And then you can see that Brandon ends up eventually walking ahead of John. Then right before going out of frame, you can see that John has his phone and he pulls it up to his ear. Both of them then disappear out of frame and they are gone for a total of 11 seconds before all of a sudden John can be seen now in the middle of the road, no longer on the sidewalk, walk running away frantically. Whatever he just saw, he felt the need to run from. Now this does match up to the story that John gave that something happened at the end of that road, whether it be Brandon fell on the ground or fell into the river and that he ran up to the nearby intersection to call friends for help. He did point out the phone call to his friends when speaking with police, but the video shows him coming back for a second time two minutes later. He approaches the end of the road, goes out of view for 17 seconds this time, and then for a second time is seen running away from the river. Now, the surveillance footage that is available out there only shows the first time that John kind of goes off screen with Brandon, runs away. It does not show him come back two minutes later. It does not show him run away. Um, but I do want to say, I just don't believe the full video is released because that information is in the police report. So that is what is seen on the video that two minutes later, he comes back for some reason and again runs away, but it seems it's not nearly as frantic as the first time. But from the video that we do have, it's obvious that Brandon is heavily intoxicated. Now, I can't say for a fact how intoxicated John was, but just my personal opinion, he at least doesn't appear as drunk as Brandon. And also some of his actions don't really support him being as intoxicated as he described himself to police. I claimed to police that it was all a blur and he had no recollection of anything because he was so drunk. He even told police that he had no idea where he was. And he supported this statement by saying, you know, my friends couldn't even find me. But we do know a handful of things. He was thinking clearly enough to follow Brandon when Brandon left Suits Tavern and walked off on foot. He also knew where he was enough to call a taxi to come and get him when he was at the Admiral gas station. Because this taxi came to get him, he obviously was also aware enough to give them the address of his friend's house where he planned on staying that night. And he knew exactly the location of the last moment that he saw Brandon because that is the first place that he went to the following day. So while yes, he may have been intoxicated, he did have an awareness to him. If he had the sense of mind enough to do all of those things, 
At the very least, he should have been able to call police when he saw his friend in trouble, but for some reason he didn't. And what happened when he went back that second time? Despite the fact that police obviously have that information, he never explains it in any of his different interviews with authorities. Was Brandon gone when he came back that second time? Um, was he still there throwing up, which would match up to his first story? The surveillance video also showed the time that Brandon went out of frame and it's believed he went down the embankment into the river as 12 27 a.m but according to john's phone records and when he stated to police that he started calling for help which he said was directly after brandon fell that was 30 minutes after brandon fell he said these phone calls happened at 12 56 12 57 so what happened within that 30 minutes i'm also curious about when john put the phone up to his ear just before going out of frame did someone call him did he call someone was there potentially someone else on the line who may have heard what exactly happened that could give police some sort of information. Um, and I just have not seen it mentioned anywhere. Later that night of the 29th, as the investigation is ongoing, it was about 10.30 p.m. when police have another phone call. Now, this time it's one of Brandon's really close friends. He said that they had been friends for well over 15 years and he was calling police because he had concerns. So he told police that John was not just a random friend, which from the way it was described in the police reports, that that's what it was believed at the time that John was just a friend of Brandon's. John was actually Brandon's business partner. And this friend of Brandon stated that Brandon and John had been having a lot of arguments over their business, over money, over t-shirt production. He also said that he saw some strange posts on Twitter and just wanted to make police aware of this information in case they didn't know it. Now, I'm entirely unaware of who posted these tweets, what was said in them. This did open up to police that there had in fact been issues between Brandon and John and John was one of the last people to be with him. The following day, Sunday, June 30th, as Brandon's parents are heading back home, Detective Hogan goes out to the scene. He starts taking photographs, interviewed a few more residents, but there was still no one who really saw or heard anything that night. And the dive team began to gather out at Elm Street Bridge to begin their search. They decided to split into two separate teams. One team was going to use patterns to search the probable area that Brandon would have fallen in based on all of the information they had so far, the last place that he was seen, his hat, his shoe, all of that debris, the skid marks. Um, the other team was going to go just downstream and use side scan sonar to kind of guide them as they worked their way up the river. And just around 1 p.m., they ended up locating Brandon's body. Side scan sonar had indicated something in the water around the bridge, and they decided to mark the area with a floating marker. This is kind of how they guided the divers to check a specific location where there might be something of interest. And shortly after they put this floating marker there, they noticed that the marker that was weighted down was not supposed to move, had started to drift down the river. Uh, they went to the marker to check what was going on, and this is when they located Brandon Michener's body. This was devastating because just after Brandon was found, his parents were in the process of landing back home in Lansing, Michigan to aid in the search for their son, and they had to be informed that he had been found and not in the way that they had hoped. According to interviews with his mother, she could not even leave her room. She could not fathom that her son would leave this earth in such a horrific way after coming into this world in such a miraculous way. This is their angel. This is the glue that held their family together, their miracle baby. That level of heartbreak is just unimaginable. But while Brandon's family and friends were grieving the loss of their loved one, police continued to interview witnesses to try to figure out exactly what happened. John was interviewed again. This would be, I think, the third time at this point on the 30th. And he maintained the same story for the most part. But this time he, again, changed the details of Brandon falling and just what kind of happened surrounding that event. So we know that the first time he stated that they were casually walking and that Brandon all of a sudden fell, or at least he thought he did. He didn't see it, but he heard a thud. Um, which is just odd in itself because Brandon would have been directly in front of him. However, it was not a well-lit street from my understanding, so he could have easily stumbled in the dark and fallen. The second time that John spoke to police is when he said that Brandon fell over the embankment. Now, in his third interview, John stated that once they got onto West South Street, that Brandon just took off running towards the wood line. 
just like broke out in a run, ran straight towards the woods, and it was so dark that John lost sight of him. He said at that point, he then heard a sound that he associated with a fall. And so he called out to Brandon to see if he was okay, but Brandon didn't respond. So at this point, he ran to the intersection to call friends to ask for help. So we have kind of a third different version of events of what may have happened that night. At this point, he did consent willingly to a search of his phone, and that was that. At that point, police decided decided to interview the friend that John had called that night for help. Now this party goer said that they had gone to multiple bars that night, basically another run through of what they were doing for the birthday, that they took lots of shots, they were on a party bus, and he said that they finally returned to Suits Tavern, and he said that some of the group decided to split off, they wanted to go to Eden Rock Bar, and at this point he didn't even have any idea that both Brandon and John were no longer in the group, which brings up another learning point of do not do not leave your friends. <laughs> do not leave your friends when you go out, stay together as a group, have someone there to make sure people do not get split up because when that happens, things tend to go downhill as we've learned so many times on my channel. He said that he wasn't aware they were gone until he received a phone call a little later on from John, who was on the other side of the phone saying something to him about Brandon falling. So we do have this corroboration that John did in fact make a phone call to friends. We know according to his records, it was at 1256, but he did call this friend of his. Now the witness stated that at this point, John did try to give him his location so that the friends could come and help, but he was unable to to find it on his phone's GPS. And I'm not exactly sure if that means that John wasn't able to find his location on his GPS to give it to his friend, or if he did manage to give his location to his friend and the friend couldn't find it on GPS, maybe John's phone just wasn't getting serviced by the apartment or in that area. Maybe that's why he ran to the intersection. I don't know. But either way, they could not manage to link up figure out a location and everyone meet each other. John apparently kept on calling him a handful of other times and eventually he said that the calls just stopped. And when he went back to his home where everyone had planned to stay that night, John was already there. Now he does not make it clear at all if anyone spoke about these frantic calls about John calling claiming that Brandon had fallen over. Um, I don't know if John was just at the house asleep at this point or if they just all arrived and didn't say anything or if they did and no one told police about it. But he did also state that the following day, that's when they all realized Brandon had not come back to the apartment. So they began to look for him. So I don't know if this is the friend that went with, you know, John that following morning, according to the one witness or not. No one seems to admit that they had been with John that morning. Over the next few days, a handful of other party goers from that night were questioned. It's not been made clear if police managed to get an entire list of everyone who attended the party that night. So I don't know if they've questioned everybody that was there, but they did speak to one individual that was sober that night. He was actually on probation. So he was trying not to get in trouble, but there wasn't really any information he had to offer up other than the fact that everyone was heavily drinking and he didn't notice any conflict between anyone that night. And a very interesting tip came into police. So there was a man that had been visiting his ex-wife who lived at a nearby apartment complex or home. It wasn't directly off of South Street, but he was using the South Street parking lot entrance to get to his ex-wife's house because there was like a beer festival or something going on that weekend on Washington Avenue. So it was blocked off. Um, but either way, he had gone to her home at I think around 1130 and he said that he was leaving at around 120 and he had used that parking lot that was right beside the apartment complex, the exit that goes out onto West South Street, that dead end road. And as he was pulling out at 120 a.m., he noticed two individuals standing by the guardrail at the very end of West South Street and it appeared to him that they were fighting. They were arguing and he heard one of the males say, I'll kill your ass and a whole bunch of other expletives, but it was loud enough and violent enough for him to, you know, take note of it. And he also noticed there was a gold Ford Explorer parked on South Street and there was a male kind of standing outside of it, almost like he was waiting for the other two individuals. Now, while this definitely does seem odd, it says a handful of things. First and foremost, this happened at 120, which would be about an hour after 
uh, Brandon fell. However, it would only be about 20 minutes after John started making phone calls to friends to come for help. There's a lot of people that theorize that these were people coming back to figure out the situation um, and something happened, but police said the timelines didn't match up, so they really just dismissed it. Um, I also find it interesting for an entirely different reason, though. Everyone in the apartment complex said they didn't hear anything. Some of them were light sleepers, but we have someone claiming that they were awake and driving out of the parking lot at 1.20 a.m. and these men were arguing, like threatening to kill each other. And that didn't wake some people up. So it kind of just makes me wonder if maybe there was a chance that hearing something could have been missed. But again, because police of the timelines didn't match up, everyone kind of passed on this information. Then on July 8th, another interview was done. And I am assuming that this is with the original close friend that called in on the night of the 29th at 10.30 p.m. with concerns for the business partner. I cannot say for sure. The police reports are heavily, heavily redacted, but just looking at things kind of seems to line up. But this person, whoever they were, mentioned concerns yet again about John and... Brandon. This person told police that Brandon had been very frustrated and upset with John. He felt like John was not doing his part in the business. Brandon was really good at marketing. Obviously, he went to school for it. He could promote the brand like no other. He was a great salesman, but Brandon felt like John, the tasks that he was supposed to do, he just wasn't doing them well. Uh, and not only was he not doing them well, he had complaints that John wasn't doing them at all. He would sometimes do things way late. He felt like it was holding back the business. And this friend said that Brandon had mentioned this multiple times and also mentioned the fact that he felt stuck because he thought legal issues tied them both to the business and it would prevent him from basically kicking John to the side to take his business back as just his own. Brandon's completed autopsy then came back and it found that he went into the water alive with a blood alcohol content of 0.22, three times over the legal limit. So because of that, you know, there was no extreme trauma that was the cause of death. I don't believe they found any signs of trauma on his body, no broken bones. Um, his cause of death ended up being labeled drowning and his death was ruled accidental. Basically that he was just incredibly intoxicated and went down an area that should have been blocked off, preventing this from happening. And he fell over this cliff and into the river and was too drunk to get himself out. And once this was found, the case was closed. Brandon's family tried very hard to grasp what had happened to their loved one. And their biggest concern was preventing this from happening to anybody else ever again, all while having a handful of questions that they felt never got answered. There was a lot of speculation going on at the time between friends and family that this was not just an accident. There were lots of people that believed Brandon had intentions of finally kicking John out and maybe he decided to say something that night while drunk and, you know, not thinking properly and John got mad about it. Some people believe that somehow all of this was premeditated. There's theories left and right and all over the place. But at the end of the day, Brandon's family was devastated that beyond all that, past all these theories, past all the speculation, that at the very least, if this was just a horrific accident, John never called for help. This young man potentially watched his business partner fall over a cliff into the river and went home and, and went to sleep afterwards. Why wasn't 911 called? Right away, they began making attempts to pass the duty to act law. This would require someone that sees a person in imminent danger to call for assistance, basically. They don't have to physically intervene. They don't have to put themselves in harm's way, but they do have a duty to call for help, to give that person a chance. Because a law like that, had it been in place, may have encouraged John to stop for a second, call the police, and someone may have been able to get down there and pull Brandon out of the water before it was too late. Now, these laws can be very confusing and very misunderstood. I've spoken about laws like this before. Um, you know, they're also known as Good Samaritan laws. And it seems like a lot of people just 
it's confusing. It's even confusing for me. There are a handful of different duty to laws that are all very different. From my understanding, almost every single state has some version of a Good Samaritan law, but it's very broad. It changes state to state. Um, three states in particular have duty to rescue laws, which sounds very intense and scary. Three other states that have very direct duty to report crimes laws. Um, so there's all these duty to laws and the other states just have this weird kind of mashup of specific do's and don'ts that make it confusing to know if you're legally protected in a situation or a circumstance where you do in fact step in and attempt to help someone in danger. Because um, a lot of people choose to do that physically. They decide to go and pull someone out of a car accident. They decide to, you know, take the gun from someone who's attacking someone. But these laws are just very confusing and a a lot of them through my brief research are very specific. Um, there are some that go as deep as saying you can only help if you were the one who created the peril, but then other states say you can only help if you're not the one that created the peril. Some state that if you start to help in a situation, you are legally obligated to continue to help. Your relationship to the victim comes into play in some states. It's just a lot of information, in my opinion, for just the average person to understand fully and feel comfortable with. And it goes well beyond just the common sense of helping someone in need most of the time, which is what most people's first reactions are. So it can be confusing for people when it comes to how they can help in a situation like that, how they could potentially be held liable for something. There are people that jump in to help someone make the situation worse and then they get hit with a wrongful death suit. This law that the Michners are pushing to me makes the most sense. It is simply asking the bare minimum from people. It is just asking for you to pick up a phone and to call 911 to give someone a shot at being rescued. You're not putting yourself in danger. You are not not putting them in any more danger. You are just doing what I feel like you should just do anyways to try to help someone in need. John had his phone to his ear when Brandon went over the edge into the river. And at this point, we know that's exactly what happened because the river is where Brandon was found. John made multiple calls to friends immediately after that. He made a call to a taxi, looked that taxi number up. He could have easily made a call to police. For some reason, he was worried about potentially, you know, any sort of issues. He could have called at least anonymously, just something to attempt to save his business partner. I just don't understand how someone can watch someone else fall to what's clearly going to be their death and then go to sleep that night. Imagine how that makes Brandon's family feel to know that there was an obvious chance to save him and it just wasn't taken. There are so many stories that we look into where there are these intoxicated individuals that are you know, wandering around on their own. They've been separated from a group. They walk off by themselves and they fall into a body of water and there's no one there to save them. There was never any chance. And so to see this time that there was a chance, there was something to be done and it wasn't is heartbreaking. On October 24th, 2014, friends, families, and supporters marched from Brandino's favorite restaurant all the way to the Michigan Capitol in honor of Brandon and to push for the duty to act bill to be passed. But unfortunately, it essentially sat on a desk for years and years and years and then it died out. In another attempt to make sure that this does not happen to anyone else ever again, the Michener family went to the city to complain about the fact that there was a huge lack of barrier. There was nothing really there that would stop someone from falling over into the river. Come to find out, there actually used to be a fence there. There had been a fence there. And Lansing Board of Water and Light had removed it for maintenance and they failed to put it back. Now, I have gone on there and Google Maps on that particular road, looked at all of the different years they have available to see how things change. You do see a pretty big fence up at one point, but most of the time you're just seeing a guardrail and a wall of green with no hint that a river and a cliff lies on the other side. When the Lansing Board of Water and Light were approached about their failure to put this fence back up and how someone plummeted to their death because there was nothing protecting them there, they denied all responsibility. They essentially claimed that it wasn't their fault because nobody had informed them that the fence had not been put back up, which in my opinion is just absolutely ludicrous in itself. It should not be someone else's job to tell you to do your job. But you guys, I kid you not, I like slammed my head through a wall when I looked closer at Google Maps and realized that Lansing Board of Water and Light is across the street from where Brandon fell. It is on 6th Street 
I will circle it here, you can see how close. They likely go by this area where the fence had been taken down and wasn't put back up every single day. And somehow it is still someone else's responsibility to tell them that they didn't finish their job that is across the street. While the Michners were not able to hold them responsible, unfortunately for any of that, they did get the city to agree to put up a new fence to hopefully again, prevent this from happening to somebody else. I believe the fence went from the guardrail and it extended all the way to the corner of the apartment but unfortunately, this is not the only location that is exactly like this all over and along the Grand River in Lansing. A quick stroll through Google Maps shows multiple buildings, sidewalks, dead-end roads, parking lots, all these things, businesses, all pushing up to the edge of the river with bare minimum safety measures put in place to encourage people to not wander over the edge. This is very concerning because the area that this is in is lined with bars. It's like one of the main strips in Lansing, Michigan. There's bars, hotels just that weekend. As I stated, there had been a beer festival. It's a prime location for intoxicated people. There's a college. Other incidents like this could happen again. And if they were really concerned about protecting the safety of their citizens and the people that are just pumping money into the economy through the bars every weekend, they would have continued putting up fences all along Lansing, but to my knowledge, they didn't. So to me, it just seems like this big move that they did to essentially get his mom to be quiet. So the fence is put up, so at least she knows this street is not dangerous anymore, um, but Brandon's mother was not done yet. She wanted to fight to have the case reopened and reviewed. I have told you the entirety of the incident report. This is all the information that we have aside from more detailed interviews that were captured on audio and video that I didn't have. Um, but you can see how there's so many questions. So she wanted to push as hard as she could, contact anyone she could to just look into this, make sure there wasn't something missing um, because there were things that didn't make sense. Now the sheriff's office, has to this day declined to review the investigation. They have refused to touch it, but the state police have looked into it twice. I know that the Lansing Police Department did specifically hand it over to the state police one of those times. I am unaware if they did that the second time, but there was a review in 2017 and 2020. And according to those reviews, the state police determined that everything was investigated properly and there was nothing more that could be done. The attorney general was also reached out to to look into the case and they did remain silent for a while. But then finally in June of 2021, the attorney general also declined to do anything and with the case, refused to investigate it um, and actually recommended that the case not be reopened at all. Lansing Police Department, on the other hand, did decide to put two independent detectives, senior detectives at that, on the case to investigate it between 2014 and 2018. And I don't know if that was just at the request of Shirley Michener or if they also felt like some questions just weren't answered. But there are updates to the incident report in 2018. Specifically, there were a few interviews done that brought forward some very interesting information. One individual had a telephone interview with police. This person had been at the party that night. It appears they had been questioned before. And he claimed that years later, he and another individual that had been at the party that night were golfing together. They had a few drinks and their topic of conversation slowly shifted over to the death of Brandon Michener and the night they were all at that party. Now, this person said that the other guy they were with, the other party goer, quote, hesitatingly made a statement that indicated someone admitted responsibility to Michener's death to him, end quote. So I don't know who admitted responsibility of Michener's death to one of these individuals that had been at the party that night. Um, it's redacted, but this person claims they were told, hey, someone admitted to me that they did something to Brandon. It appears that police attempted to follow this lead because this is kind of what you're looking for when you're going to reinvestigate a situation like this. You're looking for people to start talking. You're looking for, you know, friends to get loosey-goosey, have something slip. And this is exactly like one of those situations. So from the way it seems to me in the police reports, Detective Hogan, who is still on 
the case, attempted to locate this other person that was playing golf and wanted to hear what was confessed to them. They wanted to hear exactly from them what had gone on. It seems that someone's girlfriend was reached out to in an attempt to see if she had heard any confession similar to this. According to the report, Detective Hogan stated that the girlfriend and her mother were, quote, aggressive. Um, they also were not willing to speak. Detective Hogan then drove to the location that I believe this friend that had heard this con confession lived at, spoke to his father, um, left his card, he was told that he would be contacted, but after a while of hearing nothing, Detective Hogan then sent off a letter and within weeks, he actually was reached out to by this individual and this person said that they were willing to cooperate. So that's huge. They thought they were gonna finally have some sort of information, be able to figure out exactly what this confession was, the details around it, but after multiple attempts to reach out to this individual after this point, after he stated he was willing to cooperate, he went completely quiet. They were never able to get a response from him ever again, so nothing ever moved forward. And that sucks because that is a very interesting piece of information. Granted, it could have been rumor. Unfortunately, because this person would not speak, authorities were not able to determine the validity of these statements, of what this person told them. Another witness who had been at the friend's apartment that everyone stayed at that night was also re-interviewed, and they also had something interesting to say. They stated that they were at the apartment that night, they were playing video games, and well after midnight, either two or three individuals, the redactions and the way it's placed on the page kind of makes it hard to determine that. But either two or three individuals showed up to the apartment well after midnight. And he said that one of them appeared incredibly drunk and proceeded to say something along the lines of, we lost Brandon. And then immediately after that said something about a hill or Brandon falling down the hill. This person then went on to a little spiel about how someone seemed upset and concerned and they couldn't figure out if this person was upset and concerned for Brandon or upset and concerned for themselves. There is then a highly redacted portion of this comment that mentions two individuals having a bad relationship and that there was an argument that had led to physical contact. While many had stated originally that there were no issues with anyone that night, no one, you know, saw any uh, problems between any of the party goers. This investigation in 2018 kind of paints a little bit of a different picture. And I was also curious originally, you know, when John went back to the house, when the friend he called finally got back to the house, like how did no one mention anything about these calls about, you know, Brandon falling? This shows that a handful of people did show up that night and did mention it. I just have no idea who, but clearly people knew something was going on at the apartment that night and still no one really stopped for a second to call police or maybe figure out if they needed to get someone sober to help with the situation. And then the final interview that is in this 2018 investigation that I saw is with Brandon's girlfriend at the time. Now she told police that Brandon had texted her twice throughout that night. The times he told her that his friends were feeding him shots. Um, another time and the last time he texted her, he said, RIP Brandon. And this was hours earlier. So this isn't indicative of anything I don't believe. Um, it's more than likely just like I drank too much, but that was the last time that she heard from him. She did confirm with police that there were a few issues between John and Brandon at the time. She said that John saw the business that he shared Shared with Brandon as a side job from how she felt. That's also how Brandon felt. He just didn't see it as a priority and Brandon did and Brandon wanted to push it further. But she also stated again, despite this clear tension being there within the business that she was never aware of any violence between the two, any threats between the two or just any violence against Brandon at all from anyone. Probably the most interesting thing to me that came out of the interview with the girlfriend was that that particular day, she was supposed to see Brandon. He was supposed to show up to her house, I think originally between like eight and nine in the morning, but then he said he'd probably be later because he was going to go out that night, which he had not originally planned on doing, if you remember. Um, but after a while, when he didn't show up to see her in Kalamazoo, when she couldn't get him on the phone, when his phone was going straight to voicemail, she, along with, you know, handfuls of other people, started to worry about him, unaware that he had been reported missing. And so so she didn't know these guys that he was with the night before. So it's not like she had anyone direct she could really reach out to and contact. She was, you know, reaching out to friends of friends of friends. Eventually she ended up getting in contact with John and this was around 3 p.m. on the 29th. And remember that Brandon was reported as missing by John at noon that day. 
Now, when she asked John if he knew where Brandon was, John replied, he's not with you. I thought he was with you. Why would John have said that, knowing that hours earlier, he himself had reported Brandon as missing? And hours before that, by his own admission, he had ultimately heard his business partner fall into the Grand River. Why would he then go on to tell this guy's girlfriend, oh, I thought he was with you? knowing that's not at all the case. But after all this information and after all of the reinvestigation, it just seemed like everything stalled again. I don't know if they like closed the case again or anything along those lines, but according to the Justice for Brandon Facebook page on August 27th, 2021, so not even a year ago, Lansing Police asked every single person that had been with Brandon that night to come back into Lansing Police Department and speak to them. So clearly they are trying to reinvestigate everyone all over again, clear up this picture a little bit, but allegedly they all refused. I don't know if that's true or not. That is just what's on the Facebook page. And after this, I'm entirely unaware of the status of the investigation. I don't know if they're still trying to contact these people. I don't know if at this point they did manage to get them to come in for interviews. It's an open investigation, so obviously police are likely not going to share any of that information. Now, I have seen at some point that the Michners did hire a PI, and then in 2020, Shirley decided to relaunch Brandon's clothing line. She did add her own design of a lion to honor her son. There is a website that I have linked down below, so you can go down there, purchase some of his designs, keep his dream going, keep this support going for his family. Um, they have a whole bunch of other information on the website as well that's really interesting. Shirley said, quote, he was a giving person. He made it his mission to help others. Now it's become my mission to carry on his words. So I say to those who know what happened to my son, to those who have information, make it your mission to do the right thing. Shirley has also created a pretty awesome scholarship in Brandon's honor, which I think is really cool. The Michener family has really managed to take this tragedy and turn it around into as many positive things as possible, which is exactly what I think Brandon would have done if this was somehow reversed and what Brandon would want them to do. In an interview with Dateline, Brandon's close friend said that he wished Brandon had not gone out that night, that he had not been out with people that were not his close friends, that if Brandon had been with his closest friends, none of the this ever would have happened. And I feel like this is just a huge, huge lesson on going out and being in a vulnerable position and just making sure that you are with people that you can trust. Make sure that there is a solid plan of some sort. Don't leave your group. Don't split up. Don't leave your friends. Make sure that there is someone there that is sober, that can ensure that this plan is followed because a drinking mind loves to wander um, so that people don't have this opportunity to just walk off, do whatever they want, and possibly end up in a bad position. I know that there will never be an end to nightlife. I don't think approaching it that way is reasonable, but at least making sure that you are being as responsible as possible and go into these types of nights with some sort of plan to protect yourself, to protect others. That is the best preventative measure that we can do as a society to make sure that people in situations like this that have had too much to drink don't end up in a life-threatening or life-ending situation. I'm not going to lie, I still have a ton of questions. How did Brandon manage to successfully walk over a mile, cross highways, cross bridges, um, and then after 20 minutes of walking in a straight line, he suddenly takes this random side road and just runs off of the end of a sidewalk. He managed to stay on a sidewalk, even as drunk as he was, for well over 20 minutes. So it's just so strange to me that all of a sudden he chooses to run off off of a dead end into the woods. I also have questions about John coming back that second time. I want to know what he saw and how come he never mentioned it to police that he went back? Why did police never ask him why he went back, at least from what I was able to see through release documents? And why did nobody, including John, stop Brandon after walking all that way? I just don't understand how John claimed to police over and over again that he was following Brandon to keep him safe when when it ultimately came to it and Brandon desperately needed help, he left. If he was up calling friends for help, why didn't he go back and ultimately help Brandon himself? Why didn't he at least call police? Why did he instead run half a mile away and take himself home? I just don't understand that 
you know, level of thinking. And we'll never know how drunk he was. We'll never know what state of mind exactly he was in. But I feel like his actions speak a lot louder than his words in terms of what he was capable of doing, the decisions that he did make leading up to that point in time. I believe he was very capable of calling the police. It is very possible that this is the result of a heavy night of drinking. But if that's the case, I just don't understand why stories kept changing and why ultimately the police were never called. I just feel like this entire situation could have been prevented on so many different levels. I am heartbroken for Brandon and his family and his friends. And I hope more than anything that someone learns something from this and another tragedy like it as at the very least prevented. But I also hope that his mom gets answers because from all of the information that I have seen, some things just don't make sense. And I understand understand exactly why she has these questions. Shirley has stated multiple times, if it was just an accident, come out and say it. But when people decide to stop talking, when there are these people that have come forward after the fact, people that were there that night, and they claim to have heard a confession that someone did something to Brandon, that this wasn't an accident, you can see why she wants this reinvestigated. Please make sure you go and follow the Justice for Brandon Michener Facebook page. Please make sure you go and show support for his family. And also make sure you share this story because I feel like there are a lot of changes that need to be done in Lansing to protect its citizens um, and to protect people that come to all of these different festivals and things like that. Brandon's story needs to be heard and his mom's efforts to help the society be a safer place also need to be heard and people need to be pushed to do the right thing. That's all I have for you guys today. Remember, if you have any information at all in regards to the death of Brandon Michener, I will leave all the information you could ever possibly need to contact someone down in the description box below. If you haven't already, go ahead and hit subscribe button to become a part of the Helen fam so that we can hopefully bring them home together or bring them justice together. And I will see you guys in my next video. Bye.